Ready? Okay. I'm Doug Wheeler. Hi, I'm Via Selman's painter. That's it. From David Zwerner, this is Dialogues, a podcast about artists and the way they think. For me, it's like you can make something that in no way looks or attempts to look like some of these experiences you have, but you can make something that might affect people in the way you're being affected. So you leave a kind of a sensibility when you're uh, in your work that you hope uh, other people can guess by looking at it without ever meeting you, without ever talking to you. I'm Lucas Werner, and every episode features a conversation. We're taking artists, writers, philosophers, designers, and musicians, and putting them in conversation with each other to explore what it means to make things today. Doug Wheeler is an artist who has made light and space into his medium. His room installations give us a sense of being in a desert, of being surrounded by emptiness, of seeing light as particles as opposed to waves. Via Salmons has made paying attention into an art in its own right. She looks at the world with such intensity and observes phenomena, objects, scenes that we might overlook as totally passing and draws our attention and focus to them through the intense labor of her paintings and works on paper. Let's go back in time for a second because okay. that feels like the place to begin, to sort of how you guys became aware of each other. Okay, I have an easy answer for that, which is I can't remember when we met exactly. I sort of, well, <clears throat> I first met her, but under the circumstances, you don't remember the, these kinds of situations, and it was that show you had at David Stewart. I remember that show, but I don't remember meeting you there. Well, just some, you know. Oh, because we all used to go to look at whatever's yeah, yeah. happening. There but wasn't it was that just much. A, you know, I didn't know anything about you, really. You didn't know anything about me. I was just a guy there, mm -hmm. and I just came up and said probably something. I remember saying something like liking, you know. But we didn't really meet them. We no, must that, have, but I'm just saying that meet? was the first time I was aware hmm. of you. I wasn't aware of you then. I was, you know, I started, I came from Indiana. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean. We, we uh, got to, uh, I don't know how we actually, but when you had your Venice studio across from the, was that the police or the fire department? On that police. Police place. And I remember that shape of your space and all right, that. Right, a and, pie. And we both lived in, in Venice. Venice, California, of course. Yeah. Ve me. yeah. And I was on Windward, which which has all the columns and all those kinds of things. Where Via was is a little bit further seven, back from... Seven blocks from the yeah, ocean. Yeah. Seven, and you were just one block from one the ocean. Block, yeah. Hardly a block. About what year was that? Was that like around... 67 when I went there. Okay, so, you know, I went to California, but that was in mm, late 62. Okay. And where were you in 62, I'd like to I know? I was downtown L.A. I were went you to in Chenard. school? Yeah, I, went, I was in Chenard. It was... But a, you weren't at Windward. When no, you no, were no. At, when we met, though. And you were married, right? Yeah, I became married in 65. Became. Became married. <laughs> Is that what happened to you? It's not a, Did you ever nothing. know? You no, know, you probably married. didn't know her. But but anyway. Um, I became married, I think, in 67 <laughs> or 68. I can't even remember that. How long was how long was your first marriage? Was it like not too long? <laughs> <laughs> None of your business, but not too long. Um can I ask about Indiana? What, what, how you were eighteen when you left Indiana, or no? Do we have to say how old I was? No, 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 no. no. You just say you were end of end <laughs> no, of high no. school. No, I was uh, okay. I was in art school in Indiana in this okay. school. You know, it was a bunch of you know how artists are. They're they're like our people, unfortunately, or fortunately, or part of them, or they used to be, or something. I mean, we were all misfits in the real world and we were in this art school where we were all doing various things 
and yeah. going to midnight movies, seeing all those yeah, great yeah. movies that came up in the 60s, which right, is really right. it, obviously the same thing and maybe much more accessible in L.A. Well, you were born in Globe, right? Yeah. You were actually born in the desert, which yeah. I really like the yeah. whole... You know, we, so somewhere in the back of you, you must have those kind of f images from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. When I was born, darn it, in uh, Riga in, in, and spent, you know, a, from my memory in World War II, you know, I mean, my family ran from the... Russians, like many of the people that moved ahead of the front when the Russians were moving down, and I had some terrible memories. Of course, I didn't word, use the word terrible because they were just memories. Yeah, but yeah. now I realize, because so much of the world is just in tatters of of refugees, you know, I'm always reminded of this uh, these feelings of... Uh, you know, really abandonment and yeah. have no and bombing and and I used to play in ruins, you know, and I didn't know nothing. It never occurred to me until much, much later. So I had a very different um, um, thing and I didn't know about the desert till maybe, okay, when, 64 or 65, that I took my little car and began to drive out of L.A. And I first, like a lot of people, I thought there's nothing there, yeah. you know. Uh, what a dope. I mean, many of those spatial things seeped into me, in, and I began to, like, mm, love it. See, scale is everything anyway in, in regarding space. So it's the fact yes. that that you can make something that is in a room, but how you approach it, if you really see, if you really look at this work, then you you go into scale, you go into space. It's it's and you and you find yourself there for a long time. We were, you know, kind of influenced by abstract expressionism and making right, those right. giant mm. works which people are doing again now but I, I collapsed my work real small it works kind of it's, you're very aware that it's also an object and that it's a flat object you're not so aware but it's obviously part of the work I, I like distance myself I'm a distance person. Mm -hmm. I like to see hawks. I don't look mm -hmm. at close things so much, but, uh, you know, I, I like... So there's always a lot of distance implied in my work. Mm -hmm. And you also have to... Uh, it changes as you approach it. I mean, some of the same things. And when I was in L.A., God, there was some terrible painting going on. But, <clears throat> I mean, there were paintings that were... Mm, you know, there were there were a lot of different works. I also gave up collage. I mean, we knew we should talk about some of the people that you liked uh, and that you knew. I didn't like very many. <laughs> I know. You see? No, but the, but there the, we are. No, I know. I, I agree that you know the the meeting is one thing, but the, the kind of. The group that existed at the time, a group is too there strong. There were a, a word. bunch of groups, right? But yeah, let's just say yeah. the community as a large community, and then the subgroups within the community, right? right. Would be interesting to, to okay. hear a little so bit you, about. Like, so you say what you were. I aware mean, Robert of. Irwin being Doug. one person that both of you knew. Okay. Oh well, no, we knew everybody. Yeah, right. we knew everybody, but in terms of how deeply you got interacted with them, yeah, like you know, I didn't hardly at all. But you were really kind of on your own back then, right? Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, but the, look at I when I came when I was in like downtown LA is one thing, right? It's, a, it's the way it was, and and when I went out to the ocean, which was like a dream. Okay, you know, I finally got to where I could actually. I had this Puerto Rican ballroom downtown, and it was great in terms of for me to to explore and experiment on a lot of stuff. And I was developing a lot of stuff there. But yeah, I think it was 90, $90 a 
a month yeah. for that place. And I found one on Venice Boulevard, an empty giant store that I rented for $65 a month. So I never we, did. But we would meet. Remember, we would meet with, you had Lotsi and I had Zero. And we yeah, yeah. Walk along. The dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. walk along the I beach. I had a Malamute, oh, and yeah. he had this, uh, and then what about Walter? Well, that well, he was after. But you had he a German was Shepherd, after, right? Zero right. Was, a, was Zero German Shepherd? Yeah. Yeah. Big German Shepherd, really big, smart, really wonderful, and and th- it was just nice. V and I and the, our dogs, and we. So I don't know what it is. Like you weren't really a big painting fan, but I think we saw something in each other that was. That was uh, well, you see right complimentary. Away how you to walk with you, how you are, when you just look at things, you you you're like we are. But we're both doing that. We're both walking along and talking, maybe or not talking and looking at things and being with our our crazy little animals. Mm-hmm. And but it was like I know what she's looking at, the way she's looking at it, what it's doing to her. That you could see that. Oh, you're kidding. And and uh, and you know, and I do my own well, way. Well, we were friends, yeah, so we that's friends. how you have a friendship. You know, yeah, you yeah. see some things that uh, you begin to sense mm-hmm. uh, for each other, mm-hmm. and and of course, the art was always uh, there, and. Uh, Really, for me, a great appreciation. And then we had, and we had a kind of a threesome with. Uh, uh, you had various girlfriends who yeah, I yeah. who yeah. I met, and yeah. got to know a little bit. And then we always had a threesome with, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rico, yeah. who sort of looked out for both of us. Yeah. She was always we worried like about us. We How like about family. Doug? How about Via? What if <laughs> you're okay, everybody? And we're still doing that. She's yeah. about 87 or something, 86. Wow. I worry about her now. Yeah, I worried about her too. Uh, yeah. uh, so we had a kind of a thing where we would meet and, and wow. you know, gripe. About well, the it was artwork. it was special because see, we would be doing that, walk along the sand, walk along the shore, maybe with no one around, you know, and then we'd go our ways. She would go back to her studio. I'd go back right. to my studio, and then whatever happened after that, maybe we didn't see each other for a while, other than when we did in the morning. Right. And it was kind of, it was very special. It was had a very milky quality yeah. because it often had fog and it had, uh, uh, there was hardly anybody there. There were a lot of empty buildings. I used to roam around everywhere in my little car uh-huh. uh, just, just for fun and meeting different people like, you know Charles Bukowski. I met once, and this, I know. this there was this store what was he like? what was that he was. <laughs> he was like a old monster. He was not that old, but he was a nasty piece. But a uh, kind of a beautiful writer at times. Can be really, yeah. and he he. There was this poetry uh, place owned by this guy. Can't remember his name now, Robert, who was also a poet. Were there other writers around? I mean, I think I've read like somewhere you said that Ginsburg. I mean, like there were people were around that Allen Ginsberg might have been in the. Oh in yeah, the Allen area. Ginsberg like, was around. He was I, in Venice. Yeah, yeah. but I don't. And remember him I at think the time. he he one time you know he used to do these da 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 da. He used to. Yeah, I had no patience. Do these for that. marches <laughs> and things, and and then I I was always a big reader, so I also met uh, Robert Creeley, who oh, was sure. I love from Creeley. New Mexico. Yes, you, you, the interest in reading and the resistance to narrative is sort of you just see these as completely separate things. Completely separate, separate. but right. he's an artist, you know. I mean, and a, and a poet. I mean, wh- where is art? Where does it fit? I mm-hmm. mean, more in poetry than in the, use. I never really thought about, <clears throat> I mean, it's a totally different medium. It's not visual, you right. know. You can hear it. <laughs> so you can't really hear a painting. You have to have a couple of eyes. I, I know it's a complicated topic, but I am also curious about the Terrell connection. You know what I mean? And, and 
you know, what, who was making what when. Okay, I, I'll, he came to my studio in Windward mm-hmm. one day, just knocked on the door. Mm-hmm. I knew of him from John Copeland's because some years or a year maybe before that, John told me about this guy that I think he was at uh, some Pomona. School. Yeah, some school, he said. I can't remember. Maybe it was Pomona. And he said, he's exactly like you. <laughs> so I remembered the name because somebody said he was exactly like me. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he showed up and he was introduced himself to me and everything. Said he had gotten a studio in Ocean Park and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. You know, he was reaching out. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, I don't go out to meet anybody do anything like that but uh you know we became friends because he started he was really interested in airplanes his dad was a uh, air, airplane mechanic and that kind of thing Gee, i didn't know that yeah he was an a and p so uh right because i then must have known you and maybe i met jim because he was, we were, maybe he was visiting you, and then I met him, and he, then you were always talking about planes and so forth, and I was listening. And I remember... Uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, Elizabeth, his yeah. wife, who was playing, playing the harp. The harp yeah. And that he was um, playing she, with light coming in from the windows yeah. and having blinds up and down. So, right. you know, art is not really that kind of uh, thing like who did it first, you know, and who got the patent. It's like things are in the air, you know, or they, you know, they do bounce around and people pick up on things. And Terrell came into the art world because he was a science major someplace in Pomona or something. And he had more connection with different people, not just artists, but people who bought art and museum people and so forth. Because mm. sometimes I noticed that he had people over like that. That Well, he liked to I create these situations, like when you talked about what he called the stoppages, which were the where he used blinds and he would just let light in. But <clears throat> he had a rug, uh, kind of a special kind of, Rug, it's, or I don't remember it was what it was, but it was on the floor in, in his space. And then he would uh, have you come over, and he'd tell you to sit there. Oh yeah, remember and look in right. this direction, maybe or whatever. And and then he would do the things with the blinds. Well, you know, I mean, for me, what Copeland's was saying is, I didn't feel I have to worry about this guy being anything like me because, you know, he's, it's it's a whole different kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had, our interests were similar in terms of being interested <coughs> in flying and things like that as techno, technological kind of stuff. He was very influenced by Robert Morris. Mm. And so it was always object, using light as an object. That's what it felt like. And so when the the blind, you know, and then the light would come in, well, there was a motion to it because cars go by or whatever. Uh, you know, you have, well, this is something you grow up with, and especially as a kid when you do stuff. And, and it's, it's, you're not saying, oh, I'm, this is an art thing for me. Right. You know, it's just things you do, play with your surroundings, your environment, your world, which is so small when you're young and then it just keeps getting bigger and bigger from what you understand about it and and then how involved you get with it you know and i used to really get involved with my environment because my environment fortunately for me and not you I know. was that i just had these incredible places i mean i and not only that but your father flew yeah and so he, you you actually were flying. Yeah. Now, when I lived with my father in Globe, Arizona, you, you know he was a doctor. He was called the Flying Doctor of Arizona. So I went to the clinic. So I waited in the, in the waiting room. And it was always jammed with people. 
you see, so you had all these kinds of people there. And there was this one guy there. It was Jimmy something like, which means skinny in Navajo. But anyway, I recognized him because he was a guy that maintained a number of strips on the reservation. And my dad had gone into a lot of these places. And so I was kind of uh, surprised to see this guy there. So finally my dad comes out and he sees Jimmy and he's very surprised. What, like, what is he doing there? And, and he, you know, they talk, I didn't hear what it was. And then it's like an urgent thing. But anyway, so he goes, okay, Doug, come with us. I'll deal with you later. And we jump in his Cadillac and we drive out of town about seven miles to his strip and get in a stagger wing that he had already called this guy out there that take care of it, get started. It's a big radial. And uh, we jump in it. Now, Jimmy would never been up in an airplane. And we're supposed to go to kind of an uncharted kind of area. And so when we got close, then we had to fly about 50 feet above the ground, which is below the all those monoliths and stuff out there. Which And it was, the day is drawing down, you know? So the the whole ground is like becoming vermilion. And the sky is just cobalt in one direction and the other direction it's fiery and all that. And... Uh, and, and he's looking, you know, he's, he's right up on the dash. He's just looking out there and seeing. And we see this little technicolor jumble of stuff, and it was pickups and whatever. We come in there, and there's a two-track, you know, a little road going to it. And there's one stretch that he decides he's going to put down on that. Now, there's a whole bunch of people up ahead, all, you know, all, uh, all Diné people. And we go into this circle that they've been standing around. Now there's a shaman um, doing the sand painting. And it's the most beautiful thing see, I had ever seen. Never saw anything like that before. And the way they do it is both his hands have colored sand, or it might not be sand, it might be like uh, pollen and other kinds of things. And he, he would go, and then that's a line, and it would be a perfect line, you know. And then, and he had this whole thing that was a day painting. So he he started it morning, and he was working on it all day. And I, this is on. I didn't know what any of this meant. The uh, Jimmy's wife was a cross, and she's holding a baby who is naked, and it's really cold. I mean, wind cold and there's this beautiful day painting and he finally goes like this gets the baby lays the baby on the painting does little lines across him in certain places some corn uh, holony kind of stuff on him and all that and he's chanting and people are chanting under their breath and my dad, by the way, standing there with his bag, his doctor's bag, looking really stressed out. And he's with Jimmy, who's also pretty stressed out. And the shaman finally gets, gets it up, and they've all been chanting and all this stuff, and then picks the baby up and hands it to the mother. She hands the baby to Jimmy and my dad, and then they kind of rush off to the Hogan stairs and they go inside, and everybody leaves. They're all leaving. And the shaman who did all this goes over and he gets this homemade broom that's sort of like this. And he comes back and he just sweeps it all away. And so there are all these colors that were the colors on the sand painting. And the wind is swirling and picking them up. And I'm looking at that through this sunset that's in this cobalt. And it was, I never lost, I never forgot that. And it was like the particulation, particulation of that coloration and the depth and distance 
you know, so that's kind of where my, what really charges me and what I, you know, and I did a lot of white paintings that had trying to do some of that, trying to, you know, you never do. And, and you're not really even trying to imitate it. It's just a, it, that's a, a kind of experience of, of a phenomenological kind of thing that to me is it's almost like there's, there's no word for it, but it's just unbelievable to me. So anyway, that's one of those stories that happened and it was, it was really special and the baby had pneumonia. So he gave him a shot and all that. And I found later that it survived and all that. And, but it was, a, you know, I never got over that. And and those experiences see that you then somehow find their way in your work is what yeah. makes the work kind of dimensional, you know, so that other people, you know, you don't have to spell it out or anything. You just get the feeling from the whole thing when you spend time in there that is... Uh, um, really fantastic that you can that you can I mean you could say you can recreate that feeling but you were inspired by it and we sort of feel it you know yeah. which is really great for me it's like you can make something that in no way looks or attempts to look like mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. of these experiences you have but right. you can make something that might affect people in the way you're being affected. Yes. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So you approach the feeling as opposed to mirroring the exact circumstance. Oh, no, but yeah. the, sort of. I mean, it's, it comes out of many decisions of how you build uh, the work, yeah. you know? Yeah. So you leave a kind of a sensibility when you're uh, in your work that you hope uh, other people can guess by looking at it without ever meeting you, without ever talking exactly, yeah. to you. I, I look at Piero della Francesca. I was looking at this painting, The Flagellation. You know that painting? I do. I went to see that painting, and it's such a tiny painting. I always thought it was giant, tiny painting, and it has these exquisite things in it that you don't even know whether he consciously ever put any of it in. It's just in the making that, that uh, you know, it, it comes through when you're really doing something and you're on top of it and you're, and you're, it's not like on purpose like we were talking before. It's not like you say exactly you're going to do this for that effect, but it's like your whole body and your whole mind is involved in it and, and, relates to you so mm. um doug and via thank you so much for doing this today being in the conversation thank you for okay the, the history you're welcome sir <laughs> dialogues is produced by david zwerner you can find out more about the artists on this series by going to davidswerner.com slash dialogues and if you liked what you heard please rate and review us on apple podcasts or wherever you listen it really does help other people discover the show. I'm Lucas Werner. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you join us again next time.